next thing I want to talk about is the greatest integer function. So this is a function, passes the vertical line test, but it's a little different. So the greatest integer function uses this notation, which is like these little double brackets. And what it does is it pairs every real number with the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So pay attention to this. So 8, this isn't your normal rounding is why I say that. So 8 would be graphed to 8. 8.9 would be graphed to 8. 8.2 would also be graphed to 8, right? So we're pairing every integer with the greatest integer less than or equal to it. Negative 5 would get paired to negative 5. Pi would get paired to 3. What gets interesting is when it comes to the negatives, right? Because it's the greatest integer less than or equal to our x. That negative 6.9 would go to negative 7. And negative 6.1 would go to negative 7 as well. So let's take a look at um, solving a few examples. So if I have the greatest value, we're going to treat it like a parentheses. We want to solve what's inside first. So I'm going to have the greatest integer of negative 12. Well, that's just going to be negative 12. The greatest integer of 4.5, remember we're pairing it with the one below it. So that would be 4 plus 2 would be 6. The greatest integer of negative 9 over negative 19 ninths. Let me rewrite that as a mixed number. That might be a little more helpful, right? So negative 2 and 1 ninth. We would round that to the one below it, which would be negative 3. 3 fourths would get rounded down to not 1, right? That would round up. We're rounding it down to 0. So 0 times negative 3 gives me 0. And there's nothing in there, so we can't solve this problem. <laughs> Here's what the greatest integer function looks like. Again, it's pairing every integer with one lower to it. Its range is each integer on its own, which is kind of a neat, um, which is kind of neat. But um, the domain is all real numbers. Some functions cannot be defined by basic algebraic functions. Um, these are known as transcendental functions because they transcend or go beyond basic algebra. The most common of these are trig, metric or trig functions, which we're going to be looking at next, and exponential and logarithmic functions. Okay, so those are some examples of transcendental functions. So we have algebraic functions and transcendental functions. Exponential functions are functions of the form f of x equals bx, where b is greater than 0 as a positive constant, and b doesn't equal 1. Uh, exponential functions always have a domain of negative infinity to positive infinity, and their range, um, as long as b is greater than 0, is positive. Uh, their range is from 0 to positive infinity. So let's take a look at this and where these come from after I talk about logarithmic functions. So logarithmic functions with base b, um, f of x is log base b of x, where log base b of x equals y, if and only if b of x equals y. Okay? And we're going to discuss these in further length in section 1.4 and uh, 1.5. 1 so here are their graphs. What's this function doing? So if I have f of x equals 2x, to, to the x. What this function's doing is it's taking, if x is 1, that means I have 2 to the 1, which is 2. If x is 2, I have 2 squared, which is 4, right? And if x is a negative number, that means I have 2 to the negative 1, and negative integers push it into the denominator, so that'd be 1 half. So you can see why it never crosses the x-axis. Logarithmic functions are um, the flip of these. So if I have f of x equals log base 2 of x, that's essentially asking what power do I raise uh, 2 to to get x. So if I had x was 2, that means y would be 1. If x was 4, what power do I raise 2 to to get 4? Well, that's going to be 2. And if x was 1 half, it'd be negative 1. So you can see that they are mirrored, they are uh, reflections across the, this is the y equals x 
uh, line. So far, we have seen some very basic functions, okay? Um, so far, we have seen some very basic functions, right? We've seen f of x equals x, our basic parabola, our basic cubic function, but these aren't all the functions out there. So the real question is, how do we um, alter the look of these graphs and move, move them around the coordinate plane. So the first, let's talk about vertical translations. So given a function, if I add a constant, what it's doing is for every x, y, it's adding that constant onto the y value. Okay, so it's gonna be shifted up c units as long as c is positive, or down c units if c is negative, and this is called a vertical translation. So let's graph f of x equals x. So when x is zero, x is zero. When x is one, x is one. Here's my beautiful line, right? So this is very close to y equals x. I wanna go ahead and graph another line. Let's graph f of x um, for x plus three. And let's pick a couple x values. I should have done that here. So when x is zero, y is zero. When x is one, y is one. Let's use the same points for zero and one to solve for y. When x is zero, y is zero plus three, which is three. When x is one, y is zero, sorry, is one plus three, which is four. So here I have when x is zero, y is three. When x is one, y is four. So here's my graph of y equals x plus three. As you can see everywhere, I shifted my graph up three units. So if I have f of x for x minus three, and I have x is zero and one, I'm gonna get zero minus three, which is negative three, and one minus three, which is negative two. So here I have when x is zero, let's graph this in another color. When x is zero, y is negative three, and when x is one, y is negative two. So here I have, wow, I can't draw a straight line, can I? Okay, that's better. Here I have y equals x minus three. So as you can see, this was shifted down three units. So that's how vertical translations work. Here's an example for parabolas. Here I have my most basic parabola and I shifted it up four or down three. So as long as we're adding that constant, it doesn't matter if we're adding it to a quadratic or a, a linear equation, it's still gonna shift our graph. In order to have a horizontal translation given a function where I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to affect my x value, I need to subtract it directly from my x, okay? This, if I, does something a little bit different. So if I shift my graph, um, if I add plus c, um, it's actually gonna shift it to the right if it's positive, which seems counterintuitive, right, because it's the negative direction, or it's gonna shift it to the left if C is negative. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I have X plus two squared, that's actually gonna shift it in the negative direction. And let me show you why. So if I have X squared as my basic, most basic quadratic function, let's try writing that again. I have X and Y. For parabolas, I like to pick three points. I think negative one, zero, one is a good place to start. It's the origin, includes the origin, life's good. So if I have negative one squared, that gives me one. If I have zero squared, that gives me zero. And if I have y squared, that gives me one. Now, what if I have x plus two squared for my same x values? I'm gonna have negative one plus two squared well, negative one plus two squared is one, and one squared is one. 
1. Now that doesn't look much different, but let's try again. What if I have 0? 0 plus 2 squared. Well, 0 plus 2 squared is 4. And when x is 1, I have 1 plus 2 squared, which is going to be 9. So as you can see right here, right, I have when x is negative 1, y is 1. When x is 0, y is 4. When x is uh, 1, y is 9. What about when x is negative 2? Well, if x was negative 2, that would be negative 2 plus 2 squared, which is 0 squared. So we found where our graph started. So surprisingly, even though we're adding a constant, it shifts it to the left in the negative direction. If I'm subtracting a constant, it shifts it to the right. Okay, so if I have x minus 3 squared, and I plug in some values, I have that if x is, let's pick some different values. Let's pick 2, 3, 4. When x is 2, I have 2 minus 3 squared, which is negative 1 squared, which is 1. When x is 3, I have 3 minus 3 squared, which is 0. When x is 4, I have 4 minus 3 squared, which is 1. So as you can see, I've just shifted everything to the right 3 points. 1 goes to 4, 0 goes to 3, and so on. We can also have something called vertical stretching and vertical shrinking. I'm going to explain what this is, but I don't want you guys to focus on it too much. When in doubt, make a graph, graph it on your graphing calculator, use one of those tools. So as long as a is greater than 0, and we have y is a times our function, if a is greater than 1, then we have a vertical stretching graph. It's going to make our graph stretch even faster. Otherwise, if it's a fraction, so between 0 and 1, i.e., well, there are fractions greater than 1, but i.e. a piece um, or a fraction, uh, we have a vertical shrinking. So let's take a look at that. See, here I have this vertical stretching. See, it's like stretched. It's growing so much faster. Uh, vertically, when I have a a greater than 1, and when I have an a that's less than 1 but greater than 0, my values shrink. So here we have our stretch, and here we have our shrink. We can also have horizontal shrinking or stretching. That's if there is a constant within our um, uh, within our parentheses given and affecting our x value. So if I have, in this case, if I have my a to be between 0 and 1, now it's a horizontal stretch. And if a is greater than 0, it's a horizontal shrink. And this can seem counterintuitive, but why don't we go ahead and take a look. So here we have a comparison. So in green, that's our basic x squared. C of x in the red, that's our vertical stretching. D of x is our vertical shrinking. And then um, A of x is our horizontal shrinking. And B of x is our horizontal stretching. So it stretches out further horizontally, stretches out further uh, less horizontally. So let's describe the shift of these functions from x squared and graph them. So I know I'm going to be shifted up 3. So let's go ahead and draw x squared. Fastest parabola in the west. Let's make it look like a parabola. Okay. So let's go ahead and graph in blue problem number 1. So I know my graph is going to be shifted up 3. So everything's going to be shifted up 3. So this point's going to go up 3. 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 The problem is it's not just going to go up 3. It's also shifted horizontally. Now when I add a constant, then it shifts to the left. Because that constant is positive, it shifts to the left, which is counterintuitive. If you wanted to, you could pick out some test points, fill out a table. It's entirely up to you. So now I know that this point went up 3 over 2. This point went up 3 over 2. 
this point goes up 3 over 2, and this point as well goes up 3 over 2. Now I have my three points, so I can graph my parabola. Let's attempt one more of these. I have x minus 3 squared plus 4, so I know my graph is going to be shifted up 4. Oh, this is supposed to be down. You guys got to help me with this. This is supposed to be minus 3. So my graph is actually not supposed to be shifted up 3, but down 3. So let's go ahead and redraw this the way it should be, because this is technically x plus 2 squared plus 3. Let's go ahead and graph x squared plus 2 minus 3. We're going to do that in red. So we shift down 3 over 2. And here's our graph for that. This is x plus 2 squared minus 3. So now let's graph another function that's shifted up. So this is shifted 4 up and then 3 to the right. So I'm going to take this point and I'm going to go up 4 and then 3 to the right. I'm going to go up 4 and 3 to the right. I'm going to go up 4 and 3 to the right. And here I have the parabola x minus 3 squared plus 4. And friendly reminder that in orange here this was x squared. Here's a summary of all the graphing techniques so you have them all in one place should you need them.